he met her in a deli. She was short, blonde, a little plump. They were alone, in the back, where the sandwiches were made. It was around 5 p.m. Most people were going home from work. He asked her what was good, and she said, everything. They talked about roast beef sandwiches and how some delis didn't know how to stack the roast beef slices. She pointed at a tin of biscuits she said were particularly good, and they joked about dieting, and it had the cadence of witty repartee without the wit. When it was almost time for the conversation to end and for them to take their sandwiches and leave, she looked at him with a slight pout and said, Do you like bagels and cream cheese? When he said he did, she asked if he'd be interested in any bagel and cream cheese paperweights. She had a friend staying in her apartment who made plaster of Paris bagel and cream cheese paperweights, and this friend and her paperweights were getting on her nerves. The only way she could get rid of her was to help her sell the paperweight so she could afford to find her own place. He wasn't at all interested in buying paperweights, and he had the impression she wasn't really interested in his buying them either. But he took her name and number and told her he'd give her a call. Later that evening, sitting at home, he began to think about her and called her. They flirted for a while, and then he told her he decided he wanted to buy the paperweights after all. In fact, tonight. She giggled, told him her apartment was a complete mess, but she and her roommate planned to stay up late. He hung up, showered, washed his hair, shaved, put on clean, fresh clothes, and primped his hair in front of the mirror. Then he thought, why am I doing this? I'm tired. She lives way downtown. I have no expectation she's going to play any part whatsoever in my life. What's the matter with me? But he pocketed a $5 bill, left his apartment, and hailed a cab. A block from her apartment, the cab stopped at a red light, and he put the $5 bill in the change cradle. When the light changed, the driver accelerated, a gust of wind blew through the cab, and a moment later, when the cab pulled up in front of her building, the $5 bill was gone. It had probably blown out the window. The driver told him he shouldn't have put the money in the cradle until they'd arrived. He told the driver he was sorry, but he didn't have any more money. Then, after pretending to search under the seat, everywhere inside and outside the cab, he apologized again and entered the building. The lobby was spacious, empty, unadorned, painted in civil service green. It was brightly lit, yet everything seemed dim and dingy. She came to the door in a bathrobe. Her hair looked freshly washed and combed. It was obvious she was wearing nothing under the robe. They walked into what he imagined was the living room, which was filthy and in shambles. Her roommate was seated on a ratty couch surrounded by plaster of Paris bagels and cream cheese in different states of completion. She was wearing a red blouse, yellow bikini patties, and a lot of poorly applied makeup. The artifacts around her had a lumpy, ill-proportioned heaviness. They looked like robot discharge, robot waste. He said hello. The roommate nodded, and they walked into the bedroom. Neither of them even pretended to talk about paperweights. He stretched out on the mattress, which was the only piece of furniture in the room. She plopped herself down next to him with a cute and ungainly little girl bounce. They spoke with a kind of vacant urgency. The robe kept on falling open. She seemed interested and indifferent at the same time. He reached out and touched her arm. At first, she didn't move. They continued to talk. But soon she withdrew, and he removed his hand. And he waited a minute or so before trying again to touch her. And there was the same teasing moment of stillness, and then withdrawal. All the while, they were engaged in empty batter which interested neither of them. Then he asked her impulsively why she was withdrawing from him 
and wouldn't let him touch her. She didn't answer at first. Then she told him she'd been raped. She'd been asleep in her bedroom when a man had come down the fire escape, jimmied open the window, held a knife to her throat, and had proceeded to brutally violate her for the next six hours. The rapist, she said, had turned out to be an old boyfriend who'd gone into the Marines years before and who she thought had died in Vietnam. Three weeks after this incident, he committed suicide, leaving a strange, crazed note blaming her for everything. There were quite a number of holes and unanswered questions in her story, but he decided not to pursue them. He did find out, however, that this experience had happened four years before and that she'd slept through most of it. And now the situation seemed to take on a slightly pathological cast. She said she didn't know whether or not she liked him. He said if she made love to him, she'd know right away. But she said she didn't know if she trusted him. It occurred to him that the scene being played out between them was one she'd played before with other men, that she had complete control over what she was saying and doing, the way some crazy people do, and that she probably tried to create situations in which men would be turned off by her, and she could become even more sour and apathetic. Then she told him her roommate slept around. He considered, for a moment, leaving her bedroom and transferring his ardor to the promiscuous roommate in her underwear in the living room. But the thought of making love surrounded by leaden art droppings discouraged him. So he stood up and started to put on his shoes when she came off the bed and put her arms around him. He stood there with one shoe off and one shoe on, holding her. And for a moment his heart went out to her. He understood her. He felt her anxiety and her insecurity. He whispered softly, It's all right. It's okay. They held each other. Then he said if he didn't want her so badly, they could probably have a good time. She stepped back, still holding him, cocked her head to one side, and said, Why do you want me so badly? I'm nothing. I'm a loser. I'm not pretty. I'm not very smart. I have nothing going for me. Why is it so important to you to make love to me? He didn't know what to say. So he said, let's go out and get a cup of coffee. She smiled, and for a moment he thought they understood each other. They walked to a late night bar a few blocks away. It was drizzling. She held his hand. When they got to the bar, he realized he had no money. The wind had blown his money away. They sat at the counter and added the change in their pockets. He said something about the meaninglessness of everything, and she said he sounded like somebody in a paperback book. She ordered club soda, and he ordered a beer. She said, you're recently separated, aren't you? He told her she was right, and asked, how about you? I'm married, she said. Really? Where's your husband, he asked. He's in Romania, she said. Oh, why? He works there, she said. Is he going to join you in the States, he asked. She took a sip of club soda, stared vacantly around the bar, and said, I don't think so. Why? Because I left him, she said. Why did you leave him, he asked. She said everything was fine until they got married. The first night, on their honeymoon, she smelled something funny, and the next morning there were two little cacas in the bed. He looked at her, and she smiled. Not the smile that says, I tricked you, but the smile that says, I know this is outrageous, but it's really true. She said she was afraid to say anything about it to her husband and decided anyway that he'd probably been nervous because it had been their first night together. So she forgot about it. But the next night, the same thing happened. And also the night after that. So on the morning of the fourth day, she packed her things and left. He asked, does he know where you are? She said, yes, we write each other every day. He really didn't know what else to say. It was late. He was tired. 
It no longer made any difference whether or not the story was true. But he was sure she'd lied to him about everything. So he told her an absurd account of his own marriage, full of fantastic and outrageous exaggerations. Then he said, come on, I'll walk you home, and fell silent. The rain had stopped. They walked back to her building without speaking. First she held his hand, then she put her arm around his waist, then she hugged him very tightly and said, you know, I really like you. And once again he had a feeling that he was playing out some scenario with her that she repeated with other men, where she teased them, rejected them, mocked them, and then felt affectionate towards them. And he said, Mary, you're cute and sexy, and I think you're okay, but I'm not sure if you're for real or not. And she said, well, I'll never tell, and did a travesty of a little girl's curtsy and skipped quickly into the lobby.